Welcome to Sunday Online. Hope you are doing well. As you can tell, we are in full Christmas mode and we are very excited about what is to come over this period. If you're new to London Riverside Church, then let me encourage you, go to our website, go to the Next Steps page, fill out the I'm New form and would love to connect with you and get to know each other better. We have a moment of worship soon, so I encourage you to stand up and let's worship King Jesus. Trust the sweetest thing, the holy name of Jesus. Christ alone, a cornerstone, the weak are made strong in the same.
Last week Sunday was an absolutely amazing time for us as a church family, as 20 people got baptized, basically saying, I have decided to follow Jesus and publicly letting everyone know. And uh, for us, it was exciting. For them, it was amazing. Why don't we watch this highlight video so you can be encouraged too. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 Love, love, love baptisms. As you can tell, and I said earlier, that it is Christmas season, and there are a number of things that are taking place across this Christmas season. On the 10th of December, we have what we call Socks Sunday, where everyone in the church will be bringing in some socks, new socks, may I stress, and uh, we'll be giving it out to people in our community who need it. So make sure you bring the socks in next week Sunday at our services, 8.45, 10.30 and 12.15. And we have our Christmas concert, which is taking place on the 17th of December. Uh, may I stress here that there are no morning services. So on the 17th of December, there are no 8.45, 10.30 or 12.15 services. But there are, however, two concert times at 5 and 7.30. Now, tickets are going fast. You need to book yourself in, book your family in. It's going to be an amazing time together. The proceeds are going towards a hospice that works with children um, and it's going to be and their families and so we're going to honour and bless that particular work. Uh, Pastor Gary is now going to come and preach to us and I'm sure you're going to be blessed and encouraged as a result. Before I get into the word today, uh, there is something on your seats, one of these little uh, flyers, just to let you know about something. You, you, some of you will know over the last year or so, in our prayer meetings, we've been praying about uh, Emmanuel Community School at Beam Park, a whole new area of town being built in our borough. And uh, Beam Park uh, is going to have a faith-based primary school this coming September. Okay. Now, let me just tell you the highlight, the background story, is that the Department of Education approached uh, Emmanuel Community School in Walthamstow. Uh, they are a Christian faith-based school been incredibly successful. They're not a church school, they're a faith-based school. In other words, anybody can come to the school. Uh, people from different faiths or no faiths attend the school, but the school is excellent, and the school has a Christian faith as its basis for how it runs and how it goes about its business. And so this school will be opening in September. Like I said, the Department of Education approached them and said, could you put your school, another one, in Beam Park? And they said, well, how does the school need to be? And they said, exactly like this one. This is so good, we want it there as well. 
Isn't that good? Now, in between, there's been a few years and lots of prayer, uh, but it's opening in September. So there's a consultation going on at the moment. If you're interested in the admissions, maybe you're even interested in applying for a job at the school. Uh, then do go online, find out about that. We've got a few of these at the information point. Uh, if you would like a, a digital copy, email the office, we'll send you the PDF. Uh, but we'd love to get this into your hands. We'd love you, for those of this applies to, uh, this could be the school that you're engaged with as a family. We are actually the partner church to the school, okay? So that means we're not, we don't just think it's a good thing, we are invested in this. We've been praying it through over the last couple of years, and we are believing we're going to support this school and be a part of its life as... It opens in September. So, wonderful. Let's keep praying for that. And do come and talk to us if you will have further questions. Now, today we're going to conclude our series. As you can see, uh, it's getting quite warm up here. It's nice for me. I don't know about you on the front row. At the back, you're probably not feeling that. But it's lovely. Uh, in the overflow, I do apologize. But it's very warm here up on the stage today. And, uh, and ne next week, we'll start our Christmas series. It's called Home for Christmas. But today, I'd like to conclude... Uh, our series called Got Questions. Got Questions. We've been looking at some of the uh, themes that are part of our Alpha course. Uh, we've been looking at some of the basic Christian uh, principles, basic Christian beliefs that we have. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's December, as has already been mentioned from this stage. People are out buying presents. But I don't know what your level of gift stress is at this moment in time. Well, I, that, I made that up. I think that's my uh, original title for what we go through at this time of year. Your gift stress. Some of us have no gift stress because on the 24th of December, we're going to go and find whatever's left on the shelves. Is that right? Now, you laugh, but some of you are in the room. There are people that do that, right? Some of you have got smart. You go online on the 23rd, next day delivery, but you leave it late, and you've no stress at all. Other people leave it late, and they're completely stressed. Why? Others of you have already got it all wrapped in the wardrobe, ready to bring out on the day. Don't put your hand up, but I know you're in the room. So we have different levels of uh, gift stress. But when a gift, it, for, sorry to spell this out, but a gift is promised, then it's purchased, then it is presented, the gift then has to be received, and then the gift is enjoyed or used, hopefully, or even re-gifted. Oh, I didn't say that, but you know you've done it. Yeah, oh, that's good enough to give. Okay. I'll just say it for you. That's what I do when I preach. I say stuff that you're not sure if you're allowed to say. I'll say it for you, okay? No, seriously, though. Now, why do I mention this? Well, it's going to come to light in just a moment. Because when Jesus rose again from the dead, and we've been celebrating that this morning, haven't we? It's a wonderful song about his risen uh, death. We, death no, no longer has a hold over us. And he meets his followers. He meets the disciples. And the disciples are confused, friends. They're excited and confused. They didn't realize he had to go to the cross. They weren't really sure they understood what he said when he said he would rise from the dead. But there he is. He's standing before them. And so the disciples are excited. It's like Jesus is risen. Now he's going to establish his kingdom. Now we're going to throw out the Romans who have been treading all over us. And we're actually going to see God's kingdom. And we're going to reign with Jesus. And this is going to be so good. And what does Jesus say to them? Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. John the baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. Verse 4 and 5. The disciples are thinking that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom, which he is, but they thought he'd do it in a different way in which he had planned. Because Jesus' main purpose when he's risen from the dead is, number one, show himself to be risen from the dead. There's no one else that's done that in, in life, by the way. Okay? So we serve a risen Christ. And secondly, his priority is to let them know that they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not an add-on, friends. The Holy Spirit is not an add-on for certain types of churches that get excited. Okay? The Holy Spirit is the Father's promise. It's the promise of Jesus. And he ensures as the risen Christ that the promise is not only, that the, the gift has not only been promised, it's been purchased, it's been uh, given, and now they need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and live empowered by the Holy Spirit in their lives. So today we're going to look at who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? Who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? Now I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. When I, I became a Christian when I was 14, I went to, I, I was invited along uh, to a Pentecostal church. 
It, by the way, a little London Riverside Church is a Pentecostal church. Pentecostal church it simply gets its name from the fact that when the first followers of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit, it was on the Jewish festival of Pentecost. And so we believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and so we're called Pentecostal. That's our, our denomination. That's our, our belief. And so I found myself in this Pentecostal church. My experience of church before that was not Pentecostal, let me just say, okay? So I wasn't brought up in church. So when I went to this church, I thought, this is awesome. It was good. I, I gave my life to Jesus. I began to follow him and make him my Lord and my Savior. Uh, but I have to be honest with you. There were times when I thought to myself, are these guys just a bit too keen? I told you I'll say things that you don't think you're allowed to say, Right? Are they just a bit over the top, filled with the Holy Spirit? Sounds a little bit, you know, speaking in other languages. They call it speaking in tongues. What on earth is speaking in tongues, friends? They never taught me that at school. What's going on? Speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit empowers them. Can we just say, can I just say, not everybody in your workplace on your Zoom call, uh, that doesn't make sense to everyone. You realize that, right? So I was thinking to myself, I love Jesus, but I'm not quite sure about this Holy Spirit thing because I'm not quite sure if it's like, does it take over? Is it too much? I said, Pastor, how are you going to save this message? Now you put everybody off the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm just being like, sometimes I was quite skeptical about what would that actually mean. So I want us to look into the scripture and look into the Old Testament to start with. Right at the beginning, the first verse in the Bible, it says, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And when God said, then the Spirit of God acted and created. The first thing we read about the Holy Spirit is that he is creating things. We read even the world in which we live. So the Holy Spirit is very creative. He can speak, he can act and bring about something where there is nothing. He can be in a dark and formless situation and bring about something which is beautiful. We also read in the scripture, in the Old Testament, before Jesus uh, walked this earth, that the Holy Spirit was empowering individuals. He would fill and empower particular people for particular tasks. For example, there's a, there's a man in Exodus 31 called Be Bezael. I may be pronouncing that wrong. God says to Moses, I've chosen Bezael, son of Uri, and I've filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, knowledge, and all kinds of crafts to make artistic designs. You know, one of the first mentions of the Holy Spirit actually filling someone is that they can be creative. That God empowers creatives. That's good news, right? You know those people that design stuff that you don't think you need, and 10 years later we've all got one? God fills them with his Spirit. It's an amazing thing that God is a creative God, and when we're filled with his spirit, our talent is empowered by the living God and can bring about much more than we could do ourselves. Isn't that brilliant? The Holy Spirit at work in different individuals, the creatives, the leaders. We read about Gideon in the book of Judges. Gideon was told by God, you're going to lead God's, my people, and Gideon said, no, 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 no. I am the least, and I am the weakest. That's my paraphrase. You know when God tells you to do something, and we've all done it, and we've said, we feel God saying something to us in our hearts, we think, mm, that's not me, try him. I, I'm the, I, I'm not, I can't do that. And yet the Bible says in, in Judges 6 verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. You don't have to blow a trumpet. Uh, give us warning if you plan to blow a trumpet. Uh, he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abazil, Abazirites to follow him. So a few sentences before, he's like, no, 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 I'm not your man. But the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and he begins to lead. The Holy Spirit, creative, helping us to lead. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit, we read about in the Old Testament, would empower individuals with supernatural gifts. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10, for example, speaks of the King, King Saul. When he, when he came near the prophets, it says that the, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. That the Holy Spirit would allow him to prophesy, to do the miraculous, to do things that we're not normally capable of doing. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would empower individuals for particular tasks that they had. Now, why am I taking the time to explain this? 
Because in the Old Testament, it's like the Holy Spirit was given to different individuals, specific people for specific reason. But there is a promise in the Old Testament, a promise from Father God that actually, Joel 2 verse 28, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Don't miss this, friends. This is the crux of what I'm trying to say today. It used to be the individual for a particular job, and that was them, and the rest didn't have the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says of John the Baptist that he was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. The the last Old Testament prophet that we read about in the New Testament was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth for the task he had to do. But there is a promise from the Father here that all people, my Spirit will be poured out on all people. What does Joel 2 verse 28 say? Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Notice here, regardless of your gender, regardless of your age, all people, that includes us. Verse 29, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Regardless of our rank, our race, our background, our education, our understanding, our lack of understanding, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all people. The reason I emphasize that is because we can't live in an Old Testament mode about a New Testament experience. God is promising something for us which is not... The the Old Testament was a pointed towards what would be possible. But when Jesus came, and when Jesus promised, and when Jesus purchased, and when Jesus gives the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's for all people. What did Jesus say in John 7? He stood up at the, went to one of the festivals and stood up. People didn't realize he was there. He told his, told his friends to go ahead. He said, I don't think I'm coming, but he changed his mind, or he didn't want to tell them that he was coming. But anyway, he stood up on the last day of the festival. Verse 38, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit who those who believed in him were later to receive. For up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus knew that he had to be rise from the dead and be glorified in order for the Holy Spirit to be given. And when it's be given, it can be received by all people. That's why Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, on that day when the first disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And he stands up in front of all the people. And they're having such a time. They're having such an exciting time. People think they've been drinking, but it's, only, it's early in the morning. And we all know we shouldn't be drinking early in the morning. So he stands up and he says, these people aren't drunk. I don't know how you can speak in other languages the praises of God when you're drunk. But anyway, people say they must be drunk. And, and, and Peter says, no, 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 no. This is the gift that was promised. He says, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. I consider Dagnan to be quite far off from Jerusalem. It includes us. All who are far off will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is an amazing promise promise that the Holy Spirit would actually be a part of our lives. Now let me just clarify something here because I know it can be a little bit confusing. It can be confusing because we say, well, if I'm a follower of Jesus, surely the Spirit of God dwells in me. That's what the Bible says, right? You actually can't be born of God unless you're born of the Spirit. It's only by the Spirit of God that you choose to follow Jesus. In fact, the Scriptures, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the Spirit. For the flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And this is where we get the phrase, born again, born of the Spirit. You can only be a a new creation because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You'll You'll be transformed into the image of Jesus because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So if you're saying, I'm a Christian, do I have the Holy Spirit? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because it's only by the Holy Spirit that we can follow. It's only by the Holy Spirit that we can enjoy salvation and God's forgiveness. But the Scripture talks about a baptism in the Holy Spirit. It talks about being born of the Spirit, but also being baptized in the Spirit, or being filled with the Spirit, or receiving the Holy Spirit. So do I not already have the Holy Spirit if I'm a Christ follower? Yes, but let me just describe it like this. 
Uh, most of us in our homes now, we, uh, we've familiarized ourselves with what's called the boiler. Is that right? <laughs> You're paying for it, let me believe me. Uh, and, and, and the boiler, and if you've looked closely enough, is something called the pilot light. Okay? Now, what that is, is a, that's a light, that's a flame that is always burning in your boiler. Even when your heating is off, the pilot light is on. Right? The Holy Spirit is in our lives because we have re received Jesus. He's in our lives. We've been adopted into his family. We might actually think we walk away from God, but we take him with us because the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Okay? Now, when you turn the heating control to warm up a little bit, something happens with that pilot light. That's the sound my one makes. I don't know what sound your one makes. Okay? And all of a sudden, there's a whole lot of fire in your boiler. Correct? So that's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's not that you don't have the Holy Spirit, but the Scripture tries to explain away. Baptism is like to be immersed, like we have baptism in water. To be immersed, to be filled, to be overflowing, to receive God's gift in our lives. That's the difference, friends. And so in the, in the book of Acts, as the first church is developing and the disciples are finding out what it means to follow Jesus, very often when people receive Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit. In Cornelius' household, for example, they received the good news and they started to speak in other languages. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Jewish people are looking saying, hey, well, hold, well, what's going on here? They're actually experiencing the Holy Spirit in the same way that we have. And so this, we read time and time again, it's something that very often would happen when people chose to follow Jesus. But then Paul says to the people in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, when he finds some believers there and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, oh, explain, what do you mean? So they, had, they did believe, but they hadn't experienced the filling of the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other languages and they prophesied. So I want to encourage us today that there is a wonderful gift. It's not for the elite. It's definitely not only for the pastors. The Holy Spirit is the gift the Father has promised. Jesus promised it. When he would be glorified, he'd send the Spirit and we simply receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage all of us to receive that gift. What happens? Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power is the way the Bible describes what we're about to receive. Now, when it comes to power, I don't know, people have got different ideas about what that means. Some people think it means it can make them shout louder. Some people think it can make them shake more. But whatever you think power is, this is what Jesus' definition of power of the Holy Spirit is. Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Why is he on him? Why has he got the Holy Spirit? Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. According to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is not just for our church meetings. Let me just burst the bubble a little bit if we've been comparing our meetings. Oh, the Spirit was moving this morning. More than last week? Better than next week? We've reduced the actions of the Holy Spirit to when the Christians get together for a jamboree. Yeah. We've reduced the, 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 the jamboree. You can Google it. It's an old word. Uh, uh, we've reduced what the Holy Spirit does to something that's when we gather together. And it's true, friends. The Holy Spirit's alive and well, and he's working in and through us. And our praise and worship is all the more exciting because the Holy Spirit is working in and through us. But according to Jesus, the Holy Spirit that we're receiving is for much more that the, we will be able to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind. This sounds good. This is what the Holy Spirit does. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, setting the oppressed free, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. Let me give you three things here. The Holy Spirit empowers us to speak. The Holy Spirit empowers us to speak. It said, Jesus said, you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 4, verse 31. The, 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 the disciples have been filled with the Holy Spirit. They've been speaking the word. They've got themselves into trouble. They get together. They pray again. Acts 4, 31. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. If you're struggling to stand up for who Jesus is, Holy Spirit's there for you. He will empower you to speak. 
He will empower you to say, oh, I'm not a preacher. Maybe you're not, but you've definitely got a story because you've met with Jesus. So he'll empower you to share your story. That's what he does. The first disciples didn't know really what they were preaching. They were learning how to do it, but the Holy Spirit empowered them. I want to tell you the Holy Spirit, when he's, when he's filling up and overflowing in your life, you're going to have a confidence about who you love and serve. Not just for Sunday morning, because we're all confident when we're together, right? Oh, we love Jesus. Yeah, amen, hallelujah. But if someone says, in the, you tell someone at work you went to church on Sunday, like, what? Or maybe they're nicer, maybe they're worse, but they say something. We need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to speak boldly. Speak boldly. You can be the shyest, quietest person, but when the Holy Spirit is there, you don't suddenly start shouting. You might, but I don't think you will, but you'll have a confidence and your words will bring conviction. Your words will be strong and powerful, even when they're whispered, when the Holy Spirit empowers us. He empowers us supernaturally. You know, the Bible talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the gifts of the Spirit. Friends, these aren't badges of honor. These are gifts to be passed on. 1 Corinthians 12. Have a, have some, take some time this week. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So we've reduced the gifts of the Spirit to when we have a connect group or maybe in a church service when the preacher gets prophesying. But listen, it's, it's actually how we're empowered to live life. So we can have a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, faith. Gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, discernment. So when you're in a conversation, that God can drop something into your heart about a situation and you can speak uh, knowledgeably about that or you can have a wisdom for someone as you're praying for them. All kinds of things happen when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not always, ooh, that says the Lord. Sometimes you just, I remember talking to somebody once. They, were, they weren't a Christian. We were in a... It's a long story. We're in a cabin on a mountain in Austria. So there's a back story. And there's a few of us in the room. And I, could, I felt God speak to my heart that his marriage is broken. I, but I didn't say, hey, the Lord says, your marriage is broken. We, in the conversation, I said, yeah, love can be really difficult, can't it? And just saying those words, the tears, the conversation, it was open to share the love of God. Friends, we, we just got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he'll give us the word to say, supernaturally. Now, I know sometimes it's a bit more dynamic and a more demonstrative. It can be. But friends, for each one of us, we can be empowered supernaturally. The same one at work, same spirit, distributes them to each one. Don't go getting into the thing like, I've got the gift of healing. Well, good for you, but the gift is to give to somebody. Okay, oh, I've got a gift of prophecy. Well, let's go build someone up with that gift of prophecy. You see? Maybe we should teach on that next year. Anyway, let's keep going. Empowered supernaturally. And we're also empowered to speak, and we're also empowered to pray. Empowered to pray. Acts 2, verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. So the Holy Spirit enables us to pray and to praise God, and sometimes in a language which is not our own. Friends, it's not banana backwards really fast. It's not. So you just work, yeah, okay. It's not, it's another language. I know we use the word speaking in tongues, which is a one translation, but literally it's unknown language or a language that is known, that can be translated. And so God gives us this, this language. Sometimes we don't know what to pray, but we can pray in the Spirit. Sometimes we're not sure how a situation is going to work out, but we pray in the Spirit. We can pray in the language that God has given us, an amazing gift that we have, particularly in hard times. Paul says he prays in, 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 this, in, in, in tongues, in, in languages, more than anyone. He's constantly talking to God in this language that God's given him. There was a situation when uh, a family member was, uh, in our family was dying, and the, the last days were, were progressing too long. That The person was, was not going to recover. They were, they were in their last, uh, last moments, as it were. But these last moments were going into days turning into a week. I remember saying to my wife, uh, I said, when, when the nurses leave, after several days of this, I said, we're going to pray and we're going to let this person, as we say, go to glory. Yeah, they're going to get a step into eternity. You know, because we knew it was that time. But it was so difficult. They were holding on. They couldn't let go. And I remember, it was when they, I didn't want to freak the nurses out. So we shut, when the nurses went out, we began to pray in the prayer language that God had given us. And just begin to pray God's will and pray God's peace. 
And you saw this person who was straining just relax and see them to pass into eternity, to be able to tell them it's okay to go. I know that's a bit heavy. I, maybe I should have done a more exciting story for you. But, you know, the Holy Spirit is so practical. The Holy Spirit is there to empower us and enable us in any and every situation. He empowers us to pray. And he doesn't take over, friends. You can start when you want. You can stop when you want. That was my thing as a teenager. I was thinking, what happens if I get into this stuff? Do you like to take over? Are you like, are you like the Holy Spirit's in control of, of you? No, no. You give. No, no he's in control of you. You speak or you stop speaking. When anybody says to you, I couldn't help it, it was the Holy Spirit, that is a complete lie. That's a complete lie, friends. It was them. Because the Bible says it's, we're, we're in charge. Okay? Just so you know. So don't be, don't be, no need to be fearful about that. So let me just uh, bring this to a conclusion today. So much we could say, but I want it to be an encouragement that the Holy Spirit is for each and every one of us. That the gift of the Holy Spirit is something that has been given, but we need to receive. Ephesians 5, verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but as Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he's telling them not to get drunk on wine, which would imply they had been getting drunk on wine. You ever thought about that? You have thought that this church maybe wasn't as perfect as we think all the churches should be? That they're actually, their drinking wine leads to debauchery. Don't Google it, but it's not a good place. It's not a good place. It's not leading to good things. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, the condition for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not how perfect or pure you think you are. The condition for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit is that you choose to follow Jesus. Some of us don't believe it, but let me tell you, you cannot make yourself good enough to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not what you do, it's what he has done. If you choose to follow Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit is there to empower you today. Don't believe the lie that you're not a good enough Christian to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't believe the lie that you're not going to be good enough to keep the Holy Spirit. Friends, I don't know where the teaching came from, but I didn't find it in my Bible. He, Paul tells the church that people are getting drunk on wine. And he's saying, come on guys, you don't need to be getting drunk on wine. Get filled with the Spirit. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and see what he will do. So the scripture encourages us to be filled and to be being filled. Continue. It's not just a one-off experience, but all of us here, I know many of us in the room and in the overflow, we've been filled with the Holy Spirit and we can speak with another language, a prayer tongue. And, 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 but the scripture's encouragement today is to be being filled, to keep being filled, friends, to, co- to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but like I said, for me, as a teenager, I was a bit concerned. I had a little bit of fear about how this was going to work out. And Jesus says these words in Luke 11. He says, Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Holy Spirit, sorry, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I'm just going to ask the band to join me here. Now, Jesus has given us the confidence here that the Holy Spirit is a gift from a good Father. And so if I make my life open and say, I want to receive the Holy Spirit, that He's not going to give me anything bad. He's not going to uh, overpower me. He's not going to do something which is, which is uh, harmful. But rather, this is a good gift. If we know how to give good gifts, how much more our Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. I encourage you to stand with me. We're going to take just a couple of minutes today. How wonderful was that message? If there was something in the message that made you want to become a follower of Jesus, why don't you repeat these words after me? Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for the person of Jesus, that he came, died, and rose again so that I can have a relationship with you. I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll come and help me on my journey of becoming more like the person Jesus wants me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer, we are so, so excited for you. Go to our website. Go to the Next Steps page. uh, Fill out the form there and we'd love to walk you on the journey of what it means to become a follower of Jesus.
Like I said earlier, this Christmas season is going to be absolutely fun. Go to our website, find out all the information, and we'll see each other soon. God bless.